Welcome everyone. We'll start in just seconds. Let everybody join today's uh, seminar. Okay, um, we'll get started. Looks like we have um, a good group of attendees and um, just to stay on time, we'll get rolling here and I'll, I'll be introducing um, today's seminar briefly and then I'll hand over to my colleague, Cinda Rushton from the School of Nursing who will introduce today's uh, speaker. But so before doing that, um, I just wanted to, to welcome everyone to today's Berman Institute seminar, which is um, one of our sort of special seminars for the series. It's a, Sheila Hutzler Reeves Memorial Lecture. Um, Eleanor Ellie Tobridge uh, was a member of the Berman Institute Bi of Bioethics Board, uh, for, and for whom palliative care was a, an issue of great importance. Ellie devoted much of her time to Johns Hopkins as both an employee and a volunteer, having served on uh, various uh, committees and with different departments within the School of Medicine and the Bloomberg School of Public Health, as well as the Office of Development for the University. Um, and in 2003, her efforts on behalf of the university were recognized through receipt of the university's heritage award for outstanding service. Um, so Ellie's commitments um, took on a deep personal significance with the death of her daughter, Sheila Hutzer Reeves, for whom this uh, lecture series is named after, who succumbed to breast cancer in 1988. Um, Ellie served as a Berman Institute board member until she passed in 2007. And we hold this semi-annual lecture series, which focuses on longstanding and emerging ethical issues in palliative care um, because of Ellie and her generosity and that of her family. Um, so we're, we're here today to, um, to continue in that work and in sharing um, uh, ongoing work at Johns Hopkins in palliative care and uh, system strengthening that we hope will benefit the community that, that served in that spirit, I'm happy to hand over um, the introduction of today's speaker to colleague Cinda Rushton. Uh, Cinda, over to you. Thank you, Joe, and welcome everyone. Um, this is always a really special lecture, and this year uh, we are really delighted and honored to have um, my friend and colleague, Gloria Ramsey, uh, as our speaker. She is the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Johns Hopkins um, School of Nursing. And in that role, she is very active in promoting and strategically um, advancing the school's values of diversity and inclusion um, as we try to bolster our School of Nursing and University Excellence Innovation and Impact in the area of education. She is a nurse and an attorney engaged in interdisciplinary research and scholarship related to bioethics. Uh, end of life care and advanced care planning uh, for more than two decades. And she's done that in many different um, uh, organizations, including the Hastings Center, the American Nurses Association, and the American Bar Association. So she brings this wealth of um, different perspectives to her work. And because of that, she has uh, provided leadership to national projects that have focused on end of life care and advanced care planning for African Americans, patients and their, and their families, and persons with disabilities. Dr. Ramsey is an advocate for an engaging racially and ethically diverse populations and faith communities for participation in research and partnering, collaborating with community-based uh, health organizations to address uh, health disparities. She's taught bioethics research, public health, military ethics, and health policy to uh, doctoral level nursing students and other interprofessional graduate students. She is a distinguished practitioner of the National Academies of Practice. She's an immediate past chair a past member of the Diversity Advisory Council of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and a member of the Academy's um, committee 
focusing on cultural competency, health equity, as well as a member of the bioethics panel. I have known Gloria for decades myself and have always learned so much from her work and her unique perspective, but also in trying to understand the unique perspectives of people of color as we've thought about some of the barriers to good end of life care. And so I'm really delighted to have Gloria be our speaker today. So Gloria Ramsey, welcome. Great, thank you so very much, Dr. Rush and Cinda, my friend, uh, and for the opportunity to be at today's name lecture series. Um, it's an honor to be here at the Institute and certainly um, I never say no to an opportunity to, to further talk and deliberate and plan in the space of advanced care planning. Uh, so today's uh, uh, comments are focused on advanced care planning, but really trying to discern some of the issues that we've read about, we've heard, we've experienced firsthand uh, during the pandemic. And so I'm really underscoring this notion about respecting choices uh, and addressing challenges, uh, particularly that we see uh, when caring for racially and ethnically diverse uh, communities. I will certainly say to you that um, there are a myriad of issues that we will look at that uh, presented pre-pandemic, uh, and certainly uh, there have been others that have surfaced uh, during the pandemic. But I would certainly say to you that um, these are important questions that not only have we looked at in the past and are currently looking at, I believe it really begs our attention as we uh, look forward. So as I begin to, th to think about today's uh, remarks and all, I'm reminded of um, a dear colleague whom I studied under, Nancy Dubler. Uh, and Nancy talks about um, bioethics is about stories. And as I began to think about my scholarship over almost three decades, nearly three decades in this uh, area, I began to think about the where, uh, the when, the where, and the how it all began. And so please, uh, allow me to share this brief uh, journey with you. Well, as I began to think about this, I'm reminded that uh, in 1975, I was a, uh, in 10th grade or a sophomore in high school. And I had uh, Mrs. Janie Hill, who was um, the biology um, uh, professor, teacher. And I recall vividly, there was one exercise that she provided uh, where she created two debate teams. And the question that we were asked to debate was whether Karen and Quinlan should be allowed to die. So this is in 1975. We know that in 1976, the New Jersey Supreme Court rules on that question. Um, but at that time, I didn't know it to be bioethics. I didn't know that it was really charting a career for me, looking at questions around decision-making, decision-making, you know, um, after, uh, uh, a resulting event, uh, and that would really lead us into thinking about how individuals make uh, decisions and how we can execute those decisions on individuals' behalf if there were prior expressions. And so this whole notion um, about, you know, should Karen Ann Quinlan be allowed to die was something that really you know, started this really important question and this important inquiry. Um, as we may recall that Karen Ann um, was a, a young woman uh, who had ingested um, uh, uh, alcohol and, and pills and had lapsed into a coma and her parents, her father principally, had argued to be able to make the private decision on uh, Karen Ann's beh behalf, while there were others, principally 
um, the medical team who was unwilling to remove uh, what we now know is a life-sustaining treatment, and she was deemed to be in a persistent vegetated uh, state. So as I began to think about um, uh, my journey into further probing in the law and meeting Paul Armstrong, who was the lead attorney for um, the Quinlans, and, and then seeing the development of the Patient Self-Determination Act in 1990 and so on, it was really an important part of this journey and my commitment, if you will, to the decades work in this space. So here on this slide, we see the New York Times article that uh, in 1985, uh, 10 years after my high school debate team experience, where Karen Ann uh, uh, died, uh, uh, and that uh, when I joined the faculty at NYU, uh, this is in 1997, I actually had um, both uh, Mrs. Quinlan, uh, Julia Quinlan, the mother of Karen Ann Quinlan, and then uh, also the sister of Nancy Beth Cruzan. And for those of you who might also know that Cruzan um, was a uh, uh, Cruzan versus the Department, uh, Missouri Department of Health, um, was another leading case that really uh, was the precursor to the Patient Self Determination Act that we all live by uh, today. So these two uh, individuals uh, are um, persons who have committed and, and have given um, their voices and perspectives and advocacy to the body of work. And I'm so honored today that at this memorial um, lecture that we continue to give and pay tribute to those voices um, who've helped us shift um, in, in this space. So as I began to think about my unique contributions and where is it that my work stem, although I began looking at this question uh, largely uh, in um, uh, accordance with the Patient Self-Determination Act, I began my academic career as a project director on a study uh, funded by the Greenwall Foundation, looking at how tertiary care institutions were going about implementing that law. And as you may recall, this was an opportunity where post uh, Cruzan, you know, uh, an opportunity where the US Supreme Court really looked at decision making from 1975 with Quinlan in a series of cases in between, but really in the Cruzan decision, it really allowed us to really look at clear and convincing evidence and the opportunity that Senators Danforth and Moynihan, both New York and uh, Missouri as a bipartisan effort, really began to think that if people really knew about the op option to complete an advanced directive, that they would be more likely to do so and to avoid the years that of litigation that the Cruzans uh, experience in trying to get to um, uh, the decision of removing life-sustaining treatment in their daughter's, um, uh, on their daughter's behalf. But as we begin to sort of think about that and that history, um, I started to really notice that not all persons were um, participating in this decision-making process now that there was a law in place. You know, that having the law was insufficient to really meet the intent and the goals of what the, this federal law um, had set out to accomplish. And so as I began to sort of look at the population at large, we began to do a secondary data analysis and looking at how um, communities of color, if you will, or non-white individuals were going about making the decisions making health decisions. Uh, and so this whole idea about health disparities really started to really become front and center. And so as we continued to look at populations and who were making decisions and who wanted extraordinary measures, even when 
um, it was said that the, the care was futile. It was non-beneficial, um, but individuals still continued to push. And we started to see pockets of, of individuals, populations of persons, Black, African-Americans, Hispanics, started uh, Asian uh, Americans or Asians, started to sort of uh, pull out that we began to see we really needed to look more closely. So in 2002, the Institutes of Medicine really promulgated this report that has been a seminal um, piece of work that has provided the evidence, if you will, um, for us in really acknowledging um, racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. Um, and they went on to say disparities in healthcare uh, delivered to racial and ethnic minorities are real uh, and that they are associated with worse outcomes and in many cases, um, it is unacceptable. Um, so as many members of the community will say to me, you know, we, you know, we could have told you that, you know, we are, we are experiencing just what this particular um, body of science um, was able to, to, to tell us. And so as we began to look at how do we define health disparities, although I'm citing Healthy People 2020, Healthy People 2030 mirrors this language. And when we think about what are health disparities and how we define it, we recognize that um, health disparities are a particular uh, it is when there is a difference, if you will, that is closely linked to whether it's a social or an economic or an environmental disadvantage, that these disparities um, often affect groups who have systematically uh, experienced greater obstacles to health um, based on their racial or ethnic group. Uh, it could be based on their religion, their socioeconomic status, their gender, age, their mental status, cognitive, sensory, physical disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, geographic location, or other characteristics that have historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. So this particular definition of health disparities as the Institutes of Medicine has defined and as further adopted by the Healthy People 2020 and 2030 and so on, I think it's really important in our context as what we're looking at advanced care planning in the context of COVID. Because as we see how broadly we look at differences, and some of these differences are really apparent uh, in our current um, um, discourse uh, during the pandemic. So as we think about health disparities, these disparities were pre-COVID. Um, these disparities were pre-May 25th of 2020. These disparities have been issues that have been identified, that have been sim um, systematic, if you will, uh, structural, uh, uh, if you will, as it relates to certain populations. So OMB looks at minority um, racial ethnic classifications as African American or Black, Asian, American Indian or Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, Hispanic or Latino. Um, as we begin to further look at health disparities, the Agency for Health Research and Quality started to really begin to put in socioeconomic status, poor, rural, LGBTQ plus, um, urban, inner city. So we began to look at how other populations as well as the groups of persons began to see where health disparities, these differences show up. So as we can talk about health disparities, a cousin or kin is the question around health equity. You know, what might we, how might we define this 
this, this difference and this attainment. So we say that equity is this attainment of the highest level of health for all people. So there's these gaps, but we're really moving to more equitable care for all, equitable health for all. And so we are really moving to achieving health equity requires that we value everyone equally uh, with a focus and an ongoing societal efforts to address these avoidable inequities that we know have stemmed from historical and contemporary injustices. You know, we can talk about historical, but certainly daily, we know that we have contemporary examples that really begin to further underscore these injustices, injustices and inequities. And that it really says that as we look at these inequities, that we we continue to move towards eliminating health and health care disparities. So that's the context and the relationship between the health disparities and the health inequities that I'd like for us to think about today. In this space, um, uh, one of um, a graduate of her, of, uh, she uh, completed her doctoral education in the School of Public Health is Dr. Kamara uh, Phyllis Jones, who's a medical doctor. And as I said, um, her PhD work and her public, uh, her master's uh, graduate work was done at the Bloomberg School. So she, when she talks about defining inequity, she said, you know, it's a system of structuring. So this is where we're getting into the words of structuring. Structuring um, opportunity and assigning value, if you will. Um, which unfairly disadvantages some individuals and community while it unfairly advantages other individuals and communities. And at the end of the day, it really saps the strength. It really drains us as a society through these waste resources while you've got one community being advantaged while the other is being disadvantaged. And one of the things that I found early in my work, as I shared with you, I have been completely focused on um, looking at advanced care planning issues uh, with my research and scholarship over my career. But I found that no matter what question I started to venture into, looking at organ donation, looking at decision-making among older adults. However, I shifted, the question always came back to the concern around um, uh, inequities and how um, our systems were really structuring, you know, it was designed to achieve what we were looking at, what we had been identifying, and yet how, um, as a society, these were energies and resources that could be better utilized. So Dr. Jones reminds us that these inequities have many accesses, and I've listed those in an earlier um, slide, really defining how um, the Institutes of Medicine defines health disparities. But I, what I also want to, us to, to, to be cognizant of is that we have um, also moved in the direction of looking at, we're looking at social determinants of health. Um, and and there have been, you know, like six broad areas or five broad areas that have been identified that these five determinate areas reflect a number of the critical components or key issues that makes up the underlying factors that we've been looking at and seeing these gaps. So certainly when we think about economic um, stability. Um, that really speaks to us in the issues around poverty, employment or unemployment, food security or food insecurity, or housing stability or instability. All of that really comes in the economic stability quadrant. And certainly as we think today, um, we are living it. We're living it during this pandemic about how the economic um, instability, which has given rise to the CARES Act and many other federal um, uh, efforts to really try to address this issue. 
we certainly know that health and healthcare, we continue to talk about access to healthcare, um, access to primary care, um, certainly some issues around literacy, but this whole notion about the pandemic has been, you know, focused on health and healthcare. Education shows up in terms of um, uh, those who've acquired and attained an education and those who have not, and how language and literacy um, creates these, um, these gaps. Uh, and then certainly the social and community contacts that we think about, the social cohesion, the civic participation, uh, perceptions around discrimination and equity, um, issues around institutionalization and incarceration. These are all issues that we still care deeply about and that we have been addressing uh, over time um, and how they are currently present um, during COVID. And then I leave you with the last one, looking at how the neighborhood, um, access to healthy foods and quality housing and crime and violence, as well as um, environmental conditions. So all of this really more broadly shifts us from um, our determinants to um, the inequalities uh, to um, or the disparities to the inequalities to the determinants. So yesterday in reading, um, looking at the times, I had to add this slide um, to our talk. Um, this was an opinion piece um, that looked more you know, at the vaccine, but I really felt that the question that the 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 heading really captured the sense of all of this. That racism makes me question everything was the headline of the opinion piece by Damon Young, um, and it really does underscore all that we've been talking about. Uh, again, reiterating the disparities, the inequities, and now as we talk about the social determinants of health, you know, Dr. Kamara Jones two weeks ago uh, was the keynote speaker at the National Association for Diversity Officers in Higher Education um, at Nadihi uh, meeting. And, um, and she argued there that the word discrimination can be set aside right now where we are in our current space and that the word racism uh, uh, anti-racism you know dismantling structural racism you know is the call for today that racism makes me question everything this author says and i really want us to think about that as we see where some of the gaps are and where we're not seeing the full participation. And we're hearing a lot about that in the space of the vaccines, but I want us to focus on, you know, advanced care planning uh, and understand that these questions and this thinking is relevant to us uh, in, in the face of, of COVID. So Dr. Fauci, back um, this in uh, uh, summer, June of 2020, um, talked about racism contributes to COVID's double whammy, uh, the impact on the Black community. And largely my comments today will be focused on the African-American Black community. Um, it's the community that I've studied. Uh, it's the community that I am a member of and that I will share aspects of my professional and personal um, knowledge with you. So Dr. Fauci says institutional racism in the U.S. contributes to the disproportionate impact that the coronavirus pandemic has had on the Black community. And that's the has had on the Black community. This isn't just um, a, an awakening or, or an emergence currently. There has been this, um, this social concern. Uh, and But Dr. Clyde Yancey, who's an internal medicine doc at Northwestern University, says that the U.S. has needed a trigger to fully address health disparities, and perhaps this COVID-19 pandemic may be that bellwether event.
And I believe that, you know, the way that we're responding and we're continuing to raise issues that's pertinent to communities of color um, and others um, really provides us an opportunity. So we got going with this question as we were examining health equity when we began to look at the pandemic and the death weight death rates, the infection rates, you know, and then of course, those are two principal um, areas of our concern in advanced care planning. But we know that we saw concerns around testing privileges and essential workers and non-essential workers and privileged persons and non-privileged persons and the increased to our death rate by our healthcare professionals, uh, principally due to the lack of PPE. I read uh, just a couple of days ago, I think the number is 3607 healthcare professionals who have died uh, looking at the first year of COVID. So we really appreciate um, that COVID really helps us to really um, take a, a second look, re-examine issues around health um, equity. So advanced care planning. So advanced care planning and end of life communications um, is an urgent public health concern. Um, and I certainly say that, you know, completion of advanced directives, planning for, for uh, end of life care, getting people's authentic voices, being respective of their wishes and preferences is good work. It's good trouble. Uh, and certainly we need to continue those efforts. So so as we begin to think about patient-centered decision-making, there are laws on the one hand, and there are ethical principles. And certainly, you know, in really doing our analysis of each, each requires our full uh, and critical attention uh, to really reach the ultimate um, uh, aspects of decision-making. So when I begin to think about the laws, we know that do not resuscitate orders were really the first body of law that began to sort of help us in this space. You know, no cardiopulmonary resuscitation, do not resuscitate orders. And then on the heel of those orders came more broadly what we call our advanced directives, our durable, durable power of attorney for healthcare. Um, Many of us know it as our healthcare proxy, um, the healthcare agent, the attorney in fact, or the surrogate decision maker. These are, uh, this is an instrument that allows us to really more specifically give power authority to someone for healthcare decisions. And then of course our living wills, which principally is an opportunity to leave instructions, detail instructions, typically um, things that you don't want, but an opportunity to leave instructions uh, that if you wish to also include things that you want, uh, wanted uh, in, in this space of advanced directives. And of course, we know today we've got MALS and PULSE and a host of others that really borrows and builds on what the advanced directives has started with. Um, and then I alluded to earlier about the PSDA and how it as a federal law has been principal in terms of getting information out to people um, uh, before the crisis. And so our ethical principles ranging from autonomy being fundamental to issues around uh, beneficence and non-maleficence and fidelity. Um, justice, uh, social justice has been what I've been talking about at the beginning background. And then of course, looking at issues of, of veracity. So there are a host of definitions and benefits of advanced care planning. We certainly know that it allows us to, to anticipate in the future, future circumstances, um, while we have decision making ability, um, because when the incapacity comes in is when we want this information to be helpful and useful. It allows us to get uh, and further understand values and goals to be explored and also to be documented to get those advanced directives that I referenced earlier. And it really also allows us to identify that decision maker and also for us as professionals to really understand our moral and our legal responsibility or our obligations, our commitments to act in this space in the 
a, an accordance with this body of law. So lots of benefits to increase trust, to reduce uncertainty, less confusion and conflict, and ultimately to provide a peace of mind. So culture shapes how we make meaning out of illness. It shapes how we make meaning out of suffering. And it also shapes our dying and our dying experience. And so I'll draw upon the work of Dr. Marguerite Kawaj uh, uh, Kajawa, pardon me, uh, singer, and I know Marjorie, uh, sorry, um, where she's looking at negotiating cross-cultural issues uh, in end-of-life care. This is a piece that appeared in JAMA that continues to be informing, if you will. But as we begin to shift to look at that, I really want to draw our attentions to the barriers. And these are barriers that are identified through seminal research and, and, and scholarship, um, particularly uh, related to um, uh, African Americans uh, and Blacks in terms of what are some of the barriers that we saw in our early work and continue to see that really um, provides an opportunity uh, for us and, and for policymaking as well. Um, certainly there's a lot, uh, still a lack of knowledge. Um, there, um, not everyone has access to the same uh, information. Uh, and so when we say that we've been doing this work over three, four decades, it's failed public policy, let's pack our marbles up and go home, I would caution us to say that not everyone has had access to the same information and the population that I'm focused on um, has certainly been, has bared the brunt of that uh, time and time again. I hear that and there's evidence of that. But the other piece that we've been alluding to uh, at the onset has been this whole notion around mistrust of the healthcare system, that this mistrust of the healthcare system is dated. Um, it's dated from the perspective of historical uh, underpinnings uh, in more contemporary time, but also um, uh, dating back to um, uh, in the 30s, uh, as we began to think about, um, for this population, the Tuskegee syphilis um, study. Uh, many see that as the, the you know, the but for cause. Um, certainly contemporary thinking is that it is not exclusively that we continue to see more contemporary reasons, but from the communities uh, that I have been uh, working with at large doing my community-based participatory research, that's one of the issues that continues to come up, that the mistrust of the healthcare system, there are certainly a host of spiritual beliefs, and I hope to leave a few of those with us at the end, um, that the spiritual beliefs uh, are dominant, if you will. Um, they many believe that a formal document is not needed. You know, their loved one knows what to do and they'll just do it. They don't need to reduce it to a writing. They, there are beliefs about discussing end of life care is sometimes superstitious that you'll bring on this. And so therefore less likely to talk about it. Um, there are some preferences, you know, some may talk about um, not using analgesia because of thinking that the pain is a part of the atoning, if you will. Um, there's fear and hopelessness, what I think that in COVID, we see a lot of that, the fear and hopelessness, and that our healthcare professionals, those on the fr front line, are really having to meet individuals who are grappling with all of this historical as they are quite frightened uh, with the prospects of, of what's going on and to go on a ventilator and to not see their loved ones doing the no visitations and to trust us as to do good by uh, them uh, doing, doing this time. Um, and so again, I said spiritual beliefs because it really bears repeating twice. Um, so as we think about preferences, certainly um, there's a reluctance historically about Blacks and Hispanics to use hospice services. You know, much of my work as I served as a, um, a member of the board for the National Hospice and Pill of Care Organization, and, you know, 8 to 10 percent, 8 to 15 percent have been the range, if we will, in getting um, uh, Blacks and Hispanics to use 
uh, hospice uh, services. 20% uh, to 30% of uh, um, individuals at large complete advanced directives. So Blacks and Hispanics have been coming in a, a little bit um, uh, shy of that number, uh, and that there is a reluctance to, to withdraw life-sustaining treatments. So those are a few, and I'm watching my time here, so I'm going to pick it up a little bit, um, that cultural considerations and end-of-life care um, certainly impacts a person's, a patient's perce perceptions of health and suffering. <clears throat> Pardon me. That a patient's perceptions of death and dying, as well as their perceptions of who we are as providers, as healthcare organizations, um, as entities, and also um, whether they accept the practices and the remedies that we might um, might offer. Um, there is certainly um, accepted of religious and spiritual beliefs, as I said earlier, there's communication patterns, the role of family, the relationships, family involvement, and all of that, the communications, the role of family and the relationships, our faith leaders, all of that has been a part of what we're seeing as present currently in the space of advanced care planning and COVID. Uh, and this whole idea about problem solving and decision making and, um, and help seeking behaviors, all of that has been um, stymied in many respects due to COVID. So let's look at some of these issues in, in turn and see um, where might we um, uh, shift from there? So uh, Curtis really tells us that uh, that um, the death conversation, you know, uh, does it harm people? Um, we go back to the earlier side and says that many studies show that African Americans prefer life support um, at the end of life, uh, and that we are more likely to request it even when a care is deemed to be futile. So studies have shown as, as Dr. Curtis's work is that we see some of these cultural beliefs among African Americans. We see it around some Native Americans and some uh, immigrant um, populations more broadly uh, that has been cited in this study around Chinese, Korean, and Mexican um, uh, descent um, persons of those identities. Um, and certainly doing COVID, we, as we began the conversation around African Americans and really collecting this data in not all states and, and, and uh, um, were collecting the demographic data or ethnicity data uh, during COVID uh, deaths. And as we started to see that, we began to see many more groups, uh, including Native Americans and, and others. So how do we look at decision making and how it varies across cultural groups? We certainly balance autonomy and beneficence in looking at those two um, principles. Uh, and we also know that the locus is decision making. You know, here in the US, we really want the patients um, to be the one to drive decision making. Um, in other societies, we turn to family or in other countries, such as France, you know, the physician has a more, more dominant role. Western bioethics, as we look at the Navajo reservation, this is um, a really dated work, but again, you know, looking at how Western bioethics expects clinicians to ask patients and the traditional Navajo values expect clinicians to speak in a positive way and also to speak in a more broad and global way. So these are differences that we see in our work and how do we bridge these cultural differences uh, and recommendations about how do we get to yes. So certainly as we prepare, I think the building trust is the really critical um, piece of what um, this particular slide gives us and that, you know, how do we facilitate a frank discussion uh, when you've got all this history that I talked about going on and that there are notions around how one's faith um, uh, 
plays uh, uh, an important uh, important part. So some of the strategies that we look at in terms of building trust is that um, you know we have to recognize that some people find it hard to trust clinicians. Um, who may not be from their culture, or just in general, you know, trusting physicians and, and clinicians, not just physicians, pardon me, clinicians. And so when you think about the, your um, being on the front line and thinking about caring for COVID patients and all, we really see this, this show up. Uh, and how do we make explicit our ability to understand and accommodate these differences? So I'm going to slide through uh, a, a few slides here um, that we talked about religion and opportunities to do so, um, that we involved our families. Well, how do we involve families when there's no visit with our families and, you know, they aren't able to speak with their ones and we're having an iPad or an iPhone or some device trying to engage the family in the individual's um, um, uh, uh, and, um, care, if you will. So as we began to think about deaths during COVID, I think as of just uh, Saturday, or maybe it was yesterday, uh, that our numbers are 575,000 um, persons, um, and that's severe. And I don't believe that any of us might not know someone who um, we've lost to COVID during this pandemic. And I lost my dear aunt um, uh, this summer in July, um, subsequent to COVID and being uh, a patient at a long-term care facility uh, and, um, and uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, we all know someone in this space. So we began to ask COVID-19 and advanced care planning. I think I've outlined really well our pre-COVID. So let's look at some of the things during COVID that is particularly um, uh, worrisome. That we see here that, um, uh, that COVID, that the goals of care conversation uh, is more timely, um, that we really are looking at, you know, not just having this conversation or completing this document and putting it aside. You know, we're really talking about when it's in real time, many of these um, conversations and the need for the conversation and to elicit one's preferences and their values and for individuals to know what are the risks and the benefits of, um, of what's being proposed. It's in real time in COVID, if you will, uh, that these decisions are being made. The patient population is also beginning to look different. You know, we historically, although I cite Cruzan, uh, uh, Quinlan and Cruzan at the onset, these were young individuals. Um, but in COVID, we are, you know, um, beginning to see younger persons with comorbidities, whether there's asthma, diabetes, obesity, you know, high risks um, for severe uh, illnesses. We are seeing younger people who have succumbed uh, to these comorbidities. And yes, there are older people um, uh, that we historically think that those are the people that we would, you know, um, approach for advanced care planning. Can I get a time check, please? We also recognize that um, uh, there are concerns regarding, you know, individuals who complete these uh, directives, um, that there's going to be abandonment, that there's fear that, you know, they won't see you, uh, you won't provide care. And when you think about all the gear that we need, oh dear, that for uh, all the gear that we need in the space of COVID and how we gear up the donning and doffing that we see here that the concerns of abandonment and that we have time constraints and that these patients are really having psychological trauma. You know, the fact that, you know, they can only see our eyes and not our faces and our smiles and our, you know, that the body language, the touch, the, the trust, if you will, that we also are really reminded about, um, about uh, the, the, the visitation policy and how that no visit policy has been really um, critical uh, in how all of this uh, is being 
process, the loss of privacy. For some people, they might not have the intimate conversations with their families that they were having to have now in the space of COVID and, and uh, in the, the, the burden of the disease and the use of limited resources. So these are really how, you know, COVID and advanced care planning has, has looked at. So I think that as we think about these issues, we really need to continue to say that advanced care planning is as important as it's ever been, that we should redouble our efforts in this space. Yes, we recognize that our approach and processes may look different because of where we are and, and how we are practicing. Uh, we're reminded that there, at least there is a, a, a third wave, or is this the fourth wave um, in uh, Michigan? So we're really beginning to become, become concerned about the the next wave. But as we think about where we can have great influence, I think that the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force is a place that we should leverage our advanced care planning conversation, leverage our how we die in America, you know, the Institutes of Dying's report and the recommendations that were made back in 2014 are still with us today. And I think that uh, the current administration, President uh, Biden has uh, identified, uh, uh, named a, a health equity task force, which is chaired by Dr. Uh, Marcella Nuez Smith uh, from Yale. And this idea about how we begin to, um, as a government, eliminate health and social disparities um, that have resulted due to this disproportionately high rates of illness uh, and exposure, hospitalization and death to COVID. I think this is a, a place for us. Um, they had their first um, a task force meeting on April 9, just a few days ago. I didn't attend, I learned of it late, but I, it's a public meeting. So I encourage us to really um, have our voice in, in, this, in this committee's work. So when I think about my own aunt and our own family and how we were grappling with my aunt's um, uh, hospitalization and um, the inability as a family to to be there with her um, until she died and certainly to be together as a family post her demise. Um, when I think about the lessons here, you know, that patients' values and perceptions regarding end-of-life care um, are deeply affected by culture and, uh, and ethnicity for certain. And we know that this culture and ethnicity goes back deep as we think back about our health um, disparities, the health inequities, and our more contemporary look around health, uh, social determinants of health, uh, and that we recognize that differences between and among groups can be helpful to us as healthcare um, providers, but they shouldn't prescribe what we do and, and how we we function, that there are health disparities and they do impact quality end of life care. And they are obstacles, but we should certainly, again, think of some of what we are learning in this space uh, as opportunities, uh, as opportunities to collaborate and to partner uh, in the health disparities movement and recognize that the inequities and disparities that present at the beginning of life um, continues across the life continuum and is also present um, at the end of life. That we really need to rethink end of life care is necessary if we are to provide quality end of life care to all um, before, uh, during, and after a pandemic. And as we think about a pandemic and crisis management and standards of care, we recognize that this work, our work, the work in this space is vitally important. And that collaborations and partnerships with academic, state and local governments, as I said, the federal governments, community partners are all a part of how we are going to address these inequities and uh, eradicate and mitigate these structural um, barriers, this racism, and how we improve end-of-life care. So as we begin to think about 
I, uh, the National Healthcare Decisions Day is on April 16th. I think it's a, a, another opportunity for us to um, use it as a call to action. And so thank you for the opportunity uh, to, um, to, to share with you. And I look forward to your comments and, and your questions at this time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gloria, um, for sharing. And sorry for your family's loss. Um, it's a difficult time for, for many families, but um, I'm sure your, the perspective you brought to your family, I'm sure, was very, greatly valued. Um, so we have, we have one question here in the Q&A, and I invite others to uh, a few minutes here. If you have questions, please feel free to, to drop them in the chat or the q and I'm just going to read this one out loud. Um, so the question is, what do you see as steps for increasing discussions with family and friends and completion of advanced directives in our society, recognizing, as you've noted, the impact of so many variables? Yeah, you know, if I had the crystal ball, you know, the one thing that I would say to us is that we cannot, um, uh, we cannot let up. You know, um, as I said, that when I think about my own journey in this space, where I formally got involved in the academic pursuits around my scholarship and my research, it's been nearly three decades. Um, and I continue, you know, I talk to, particularly when I talk to my faith leaders um, and their role in the, the, the African-American community and the role of the church, the church has been an institution for us um, for everything. It's, you know, we're key informants you know, um, uh, are assembled, that the larger community come there for guidance and insights. And when I work with the, the faith community leaders, you know, I underscore that point that, you know, there's much work to be done here, um, that, you know, there's some things that we're talking about today that I will say to you, Two decades ago, we tried, you know, when we thought about the implementation of the, the Patient Self-Determination Act on the heel of um, the Nancy Beth Cruzan case. We thought that perhaps by having a law in place that says that everybody should be on notice about their right to um, accept or refuse life-sustaining treatments and their option to complete it to complete an advanced directive, you know. You know, for me, it was hallelujah day, but then we began to see that we didn't see the, you know, the shift in behaviors and, and um, that was in alignment with that law at that time. Um, so I say to you, it's multi faceted, that there are many levels, there are levels for what we can do as um, uh, clinicians. Um, before, you know, how do we build trust? How do we build relationships? What does trustworthiness look like? How do we continue to uh, shape and influence, you know, the attitudes of our community members? How do we bring them in, engage them in for all decisions? And it would also include end of life care, where it doesn't look like we're just talking about end of life care because we don't value um, the members and we're wanting people to say no to stuff that they believe that they want and, uh, and, and, um, uh, are entitled to at this point, um, and, and you're saying no to that. So a little bit long-winded, sorry about that, but um, multifaceted and, and that um, we can't let up and to use whatever mechanisms are currently and COVID is our platform right now and let's use it. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll take one other question here. Um, so I see, um, Ask, there's a question about um, whether or not attitudes have changed over the last 20 years since you've um, some yes. decided. Yes, yes. I'm excited to say that it has. I'm so excited to say to you that, you know, there was earlier literature said that African-Americans, Blacks did not complete advanced directives. And we do. <laughs> we do. We actually do. We do when we get information from individuals who we trust and regard, and we have time to process and let it ruminate, and we're not you know, under the gun, and we have time to talk to our faith leaders and, and, and to be in alignment. Yes, yes, I do. I have seen a shift. Now, is it 
to the 30% that generally know we're not quite there, but I certainly have seen many more persons. And I remain optimistic that the more we talk about this, the more that we will have people who appreciate and understand why um, this has been a body of um, opportunities for us in terms of a concept call advanced directives. And I think we'll maybe perhaps there'll be some additional opportunities to build on, on that um, after um, having gone through what I think many communities have gone through with COVID and thinking about advanced planning in that context as well. It'll be interesting to see for decades to come how we think about the effects, the long-term effects of COVID on, on your area of work. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, I think we'll probably just take the opportunity to wrap up now since we're at the top of the hour and just thank you Gloria, again, for joining us and, and for your talk. Um, and just thank everybody for attending. For attending. And, um, yeah, look forward to our next seminar, which will be in about two weeks. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone.